Hello, Dawes Road family, and to those of you who've tuned in, welcome in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ, especially on this Father's Day 2020. We want to take a few moments to talk to men today, uh, and there's a lot to talk about, um, about being a good father, being a good husband, but we want to talk about something even bigger than that. You see, when, the, when God made the first man, Adam, before Adam became a, uh, a husband, before he became a father, God gave him a mission, something to accomplish, something to achieve. Now, I know that in today's society, it is politically incorrect to make those distinctions between men and women, but the reality is, the truth is, rooted in creation, God did make us different. So, men, we want to take a few moments to talk uh, today about some of those truths. And, and ladies, please listen along. Uh, so that you can be the encouragers for our men as they grow in manliness. So, men, we want to talk a little bit about mission. We want to talk a little bit about being ready. We want to talk a little bit about being strong. And may God bless you as we continue to grow in the mission that God has given to us for the glory of Christ. So, let's listen in on the pulpit as we get into the precious Word of God. God bless you. Once again... Happy Father's Day 2020, and uh, welcome in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We do want to take a few moments to talk to men today. And uh, ladies, we want you to listen along so that you can be the encouragers. We need encouragement as we continue in this journey of manliness. A huge agenda, a huge item for us men to grapple with in our generation is that whole idea of self-identification. Um, a few years ago, a few generations ago, it was pretty clear. A man was this, a, man, a woman was that. It was, it was pretty clear. But in these days, with the political discussions and conversations taking place, some of those lines between men and women are being blur, blurred, even though God's ultimate creation design was that God created male and female. So if I were to ask you today, how would you self-identify particularly men, who are you, what are you, what would your response be? Now, what I'm really hoping is that you'll respond biblically. I mean, we say that we're followers of Jesus Christ, so how do we respond to that question in a biblical way? I know the world has their whole set of agendas and so many different levels on how to respond to that, how to self-identify, but the question is, how do you self-identify? What are you, who are you? Uh, what do you call yourself? It's very interesting. You know that God himself self-identified? We have an interesting conversation in Exodus chapter 3, and God was asked to self-identify. Now, the conversation is that the people of Israel had been in slavery in Egypt for quite a number of years. God saw their misery and wanted to send a, a rescuer to set the people free, and he chose Moses to do that task. So he has an interesting meeting with Moses. God um, shows himself in the burning bush. Moses, who was a shepherd at that time and is now uh, approaching 80 years of age, goes over to look at this burning bush that is not being consumed. It is God. It is God appearing to Moses. God tells Moses what he wants Moses to do. He's supposed to go to Egypt and bring out his people. Um, <laughs> Moses' question is, well, who am I? Who am I? And I love God's answer. Uh, you are the one that I am going with. So Moses is saying, who am I? Who am I? Like, how, how do I rate this job? How do, I, how do I qualify for this job? And God's answer was, you're the one that I am going with. And Moses' immediate response is really, in a sense, if I could paraphrase a little bit, well, who are you? Who are you? What, what do I call you? Who are you? God answers wonderfully. I am what? I am Yahweh. I am the self-sufficient one. Yahweh means I am that I am. I don't need anything. I, I, I don't change. I'm omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. I am that I am. <laughs> Eternally. I am Yahweh. See, God self-identifies. In the Old Testament, God, up to that point, also demonstrated himself as El Shaddai. I am the powerful one who can and wants to meet your needs. So God, in, in numerous ways, self-identifies himself. 
um, of, of course, as we come now to the New Testament, God identifies himself very specifically as what? Our Father. When Jesus taught us to pray, we weren't to address God as, well, dear God. What, what did Jesus teach us? How did Jesus teach us to pray? He said, Our Father who is in heaven. Uh, that is how God is self identifying. He is our Father. He also self identifies as our Lord. Now, of course, there's so many other things in Old Testament and New Testament that we could so very easily unpack. But let me give you one more that is in both Old Testament and New Testament. And that is this God is a warrior. God is a warrior. It's very interesting, this same Moses, just a few chapters later, as he watches God rescue his people through incredible miracle after miracle after miracle, and then takes them through the Red Sea on dry land, like, wow. And the armies of Egypt are completely annihilated, not because of what Moses did, but because of what God has done. God is very clearly self-identifying himself as a warrior, as a matter of fact, the warrior. Exodus chapter 15, verse 3, the Lord is a warrior. That Hebrew term there, warrior, actually means a man of war. God is saying, is saying I am a man of war. The next phrase is, the Lord is his name. In other words, if you're looking for the ultimate warrior, you're looking for the ultimate combatant, it is God himself. Wow, what a self-identification. Not too many years later, well, actually, it would be a number of years later, the psalmist would write this beautiful psalm in Psalm 24, and it would be David. And David acknowledges this. Now, Psalm 24 starts off this way. The, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. I mean, the world is his. But do you know how he ends the psalm, the last few verses? He identifies God as the king of glory, who is the great warrior. Listen to these verses. Lift up your heads. This is uh, Psalm 24, beginning of verse 7. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, He is the King of glory. Now, when it says the Lord Almighty, that's an interesting word. Uh, the word Almighty, uh, it, as translated in English, is the idea that He's all-powerful. The Hebrew word Almighty there has the idea that He's the commander of the armies of heaven so that He cannot be defeated. That's who our God is. He is the mighty warrior. Now, that's not just an Old Testament concept. That's a New Testament concept as well. If I were to turn all the way back to the, the last book of our Bibles in the Revelation, uh, some beautiful verses there concerning the fact that our God, our Lord Jesus Christ, is a warrior. Let me pick it up at Revelation chapter 19 and beginning at verse 11. It says this, and I'm going I'm to read this passage, but I just want you to get a sense that our God self-identifies, our Savior Jesus self-identifies as a warrior. Now listen to this. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. Who is this rider? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll see that clearly in just a few moments. He is, with justice, He judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on His head are many crowns. He is a name written on Him that no one knows but He Himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, Oh, He is the one who has provided our salvation through His sacrifice on the cross and then through His resurrection. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and His name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following Him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, by the way, those armies of heaven, you know who they are. It's not referring to angels here. That's referring to us who are the genuine followers of Jesus Christ, who have put our faith and trust in Christ because He's the one who died for our sins and rose again from the dead so that we could be forgiven. Have, are, are you part of that heavenly army? Are you part of the kingdom of God? Are you part of the family of God? Have you experienced forgiveness and the grace of God in your life? There is only one way to have eternal life, and that's through Jesus. 
and that would qualify you to be part of this heavenly army. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And then there's a quote from the Old Testament from Psalm 2. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords, praise his name. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. Um, The idea there is he's standing in front of the sun so that the sun forms a glorious halo around him. I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty of horses and the riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword, coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil, Satan, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. You see, God, our Lord Jesus, is the warrior king whom we call Lord, whom we call master, whom we call commander. So I'm hoping that as you self-identify, that you will self-identify primarily as this. I am a follower of Jesus. I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, folks, we need to grab afresh in this generation that self-identification. Who are you? What are you? I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Because we live in particularly... As we're walking through this pandemic, all sorts of social issues have arisen. And, 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 we're, and, and so often, different groups are polarizing in different directions and so on. But we as followers of Jesus Christ need to make sure that our primary self-identification is a follower of Jesus. Being a follower of Jesus is more important than declaring myself as a particular social status or an e- economic success, whether I'm poor or rich more important than any ethnic background where I've come from, more important than even my religious background, more important than the color of my skin. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I am a Jesus warrior. I am a Jesus warrior. Now, even as I say that, acknowledging that our God is the ultimate warrior and that I'm a follower of Jesus and I'm a Jesus warrior, I I just want to clarify this, and I'm going to read a few passages of scriptures to help us to clarify that. This is not a physical battle. I know there's some religions that feel that they need to dominate and conquer by actually using physical and violent means to do so if necessary. That is not the kingdom of Jesus. It's a spiritual battle that we're in. Uh, Let me just walk through a, a a number of passages of scriptures that would maybe help us with this. For instance, in Matthew chapter 26, um, just, this is the time when Jesus is arrested in the garden there. And one of his disciples takes the sword and tries to chop off a guy's head to try to defend Jesus. And he only chops off his ear. Remember Peter doing that? Well, it's very interesting. Jesus responds at that time. He says this, put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. For all who draw the sword will draw, die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? In other words, I'm the commander of the heavenly host. A legion could have been anywhere from 600 to 6,000 soldiers. Jesus is saying, I, I, I've got command of 12,000, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, well, sorry, 12 legions 
12 times 6,000, 72,000 angels. You don't think that's enough to defeat any of the enemies of Jesus? Wow, you go back to the Old Testament, one angel wiped out 185,000. That was just one. He's got command of 72,000 plus, plus all of the rest of the armies of heaven. It's just a figure of speech. I, I, I'm the commander. I'm the commander. And the Father will put them all at my disposal. But how then would the scripture be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? We're not in a physical battle here, my dear disciples. This is a spiritual battle, and we must do the will of God. Now, Jesus, at the same time, just the very next morning, is having a conversation now with Pilate, the Roman governor, who would eventually sign the death certificate or the execution certificate for Jesus. Um, they needed his permission to crucify our Lord Jesus Christ. Very interesting discussion. Um, Pilate went back into the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus asked, Is that your own idea, or did others talk to you about this? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Now listen to the words of Jesus. My kingdom, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Now, that's an amazing verse. Now, we lo lose a lot of the, the, the power and the impact of that in the English translation. Because in the, in the way that John recorded these words of Jesus, it shows an incredible impact. This is, these are my servants that belong to me. This is my kingdom my kingdom, it's not like earthly kingdoms. We're not here by physical force. This is my kingdom, kingdom that I rule over as a spiritual kingdom. Uh, yes, certainly there is a physical component to that, but it's ultimately a spiritual and an eternal kingdom. Um, um, let me take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. The Apostle Paul would remind us that we are in a spiritual battle. He would say this. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war. Now, there's that warrior concept again. We do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's the spiritual warfare that we're in. And then he would add this. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Again, the Apostle Paul. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything... To stand, in other words, at the end of the day, to stand firm in the faith of Christ means victory. See, it's a spiritual warfare. He would, the Apostle Paul again would talk to a young man who was seeking to share the good news of Jesus, and he would say this, you then, my son, not that he was literally a son, but a son in the faith, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. And then let me just add one more verse to uh, this pile of verses. We could, we could or this list of verses, we could add very easily so many more. But the Apostle John would write this. Uh, he would say this in the last part of 1 John chapter 2, verse 14. I write to you, young men, because you're strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. You have conquered the evil one. You have defeated the evil one. We are in a spiritual battle. Now, my dear brothers in Christ, men, men, I hope you've put your faith and trust in Christ so that I can legitimately call you my brothers in Christ. Men, 
We are on mission. We're a mission. As a follower of Jesus, we are His warriors. That means we're on a mission. We're on a mission. The big picture of this mission is found for us in, in places like Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus gives the big mission, the big picture of the mission that He is on. He would say this, and, and, and I think you, you remember the story a little bit. It's uh, Jesus is in the northern part of Israel, a place where the ultimate deity is being worshipped. Um, at one point it was Pan, and then of course when the Roman Empire took on, it was supposed to be the Caesar. So it was um, um, a, a place to acknowledge who is the greatest deity, the greatest God. It's at this place that Jesus asked His disciples, well, who do people say I am? Um, and they gave a list of some of the prophets and so on. Well, who do you say I am? Excuse me, who do you say I am? Peter says, you're the Messiah, you're the Son of God. I love Jesus' response. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Now listen to this. And I tell you that you are Peter. Yes, I have renamed you. I've given you a nickname, Peter Rock. Now there's this play on words. And upon this rock, not on Peter, but referring to himself, I am the rock. I've called you rock because you're going to be a proclaimer of me, the rock. But upon this rock, Jesus Christ, I will build my church. Now listen to this. And the gates of hell, the gates of Hades will not, um, will not overcome it. It will not prevail. It will not defeat my mission, which is to build my church. Jesus calls us to be part of that mission. Just before Jesus went to heaven, Jesus called the believers together in the northern part of Israel, in Galilee, after His resurrection. And He would say this, All authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Therefore, as you are going, is probably the best way to translate that, therefore, as you're going, make disciples of all nations. How? baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In other words, as you present the gospel, a call to actually receive Jesus as their Lord, their Savior, their King. Yes, and demonstrate that by being baptized. And then teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And then he leaves them with his pro promise. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Now what I love about this mission, dear family of God, men and women, we are on the winning side. We are on the winning side. Hebrews chapter 2 makes that very clear that the, the battle has actually been won at the cross. And by the way, I love to win. I love to be on the winning side. And it's so good to know that as I go into battle, I'm already on the winning side. There might be some hardships in the actual battle. There may be times when the enemy seems like he's won, but the battle is, the war is already won. The war is already won. It was won at the cross. Listen to this, listen to this. Since the children, that is us, the, those who would put their faith and trust in Jesus, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, the cross, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil and, uh, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. We've already won. We've already won. We've won this battle. So we're on mission. We're on mission. We're to make disciples because that's the mission of Christ. He's going to build his church. Now, as you know, each warrior, each soldier has their own particular task. Some of them are cooks, some are administrative, some are on the front lines, some of them are on logistics, some of them are pilots, some of them are, well, you, you get the idea. The, the, they're, they're, there's the big mission, but then there's their particular tasks, their little missions within the big mission. Maybe you don't know what your particular mission is in this big mission that Christ has called us to, and that's okay, that's okay. So even as we consider the the mission that we're supposed to be involved in, what we need to do then is, if we don't know what our particular little mission is in the big mission, is we need to be in training. We need to be training. Be ready. 
so that when the commander calls us forward to take care of a particular matter that he wants us to take care of, we're ready to go. Now, there's been um, a, a couple of verses found in the Old Testament that has really encouraged me to help me to be ready, to be ready. Now, I've been, I, I, I've been doing my part in the, in the kingdom of God. My particular calling, my particular mission is to proclaim the good news of Jesus. I've been doing that for um, four, 40 years, more than 40 years. I've been sharing the good news of Jesus. But I'm still in training. And some of you are know what your particular mission is. Some of you may not. But we need to keep on training. Uh, we need to keep on training. A good soldier is about actually just two things. He's either in the battle fighting or he's training and preparing to get into the battle. And so if you're not in the battle, you need to be training. You need to be training. Well, how do I train? How do I train? Well, spiritually speaking, and this can apply to all sorts of different parts of my life, we can find the truths of that in 1 Samuel chapter 16. They needed to, uh, and, and the context is, it's the very next chapter is that David, and that's the man that they're going to be talking about, David is the one who's going to fight Goliath, Goliath. But David, all his life, was preparing for not only that moment, but for the moments even after defeating that tall, giant Goliath. Now, David didn't know he was going to fight Goliath. He didn't know that. But he's preparing anyways. Now, listen to the testimony about David. It says this. One of the servants asked, answered King Saul in this inquiry, who do we find to, to help us out with this? Uh, he says, I've seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem, David, who knows how to play the lyre, He's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. And then we're going to find a seventh thing in David's conversation with the men. Let me just delineate these very, very quickly for you. Number one, he says he knows how to play the lyre. In, in other words, the guitar. The guitar. Now, what does playing a guitar have to do with being a warrior? Well, the point is that David ha had been given some God-given skills, and he got good at them. So in other words, if God has given you a particular skill, be good at it. If you're an artist, if you're a musician, if you're good with numbers, if you're good with facts, if you're good with people skills or whatever it is, whatever you can do and can do it well, make sure you can do it to the very best of your ability. And that was David. That was David. Second of all, it says here he was brave. He was willing to confront even fearful situations. And not only was he brave, but the, the servant said, well, he's a warrior. In other words, he understood the conflict. And men, I need to ask us, do we understand the conflict today? A lot of us are being distracted by worldly rhetoric. But folks, we need to understand the war that we're in. And we need to understand the mission that God has called us to. Are you a warrior? Let's train well. It says he or he speaks well. In other words, the, the, the way David spoke was respectful. It was clear, not using bad, bad language or obscenities. He gave praise and honor to God. Um, he was known for speaking well. And he's a fine-looking man. Now, when it says he's a fine-looking man, it, it's more than just he was handsome. Now, I, I, I think David was handsome, but it was more than that. The, the idea here, it, it's speaking of his character, it's how did he carry himself? How did he carry himself? Now, some of us ugly guys can still be fine looking if we carry ourselves well. I mean, if you dress with your, your, your pants around your ankles, I mean, that doesn't look good. If, if you're trying to say, you know, I, I, I'm seeking to be successful, I'm up and coming, you, you dress the part. You look well. You stand up straight. You smile a lot. I think David was a very cheerful kind of fellow. Um, you, you smile. You, you've got this cheerful disposition. You carry yourself well. You dress yourself well. Now, I don't mean expensively, but you don't look like a slob. And you don't look, as it were, nasty and angry all the time. No, you look well. And, and finally, it says here, and the Lord was with him. It was obvious that he gained his wisdom and his guidance from God. He would often give praise to God. God willing, I'll do this. Thank you, God, for this. Praise God for this. It was clear that David was motivated by God. And then finally, we, we find the seventh thing there in the next chapter as David is having a conversation with Saul. 
And if I could just summarize it this way, David recognized that every experience in his life was for training. That's what I did. He understood that whatever happened in his life wasn't just for the moment. It had an impact in the future. And he may not have understood that. He didn't understand at the moment that when he was a shepherd protecting his sheep from a lion and then later on a bear, that this was going to help him face a 10-foot giant later on. But he, he understood it at the, at, uh, when it really came down to it. Listen to what he says. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. When that lion took one of my sheep, I hit that lion and he dropped the sheep. And then when the lion came after me, I grabbed him by his beard, as it were, and I killed him. And now that that's happened to me, I know, I know that God will give me the grace, the strength, the wisdom, and whatever skill is needed to take out this 10-foot Goliath because God has put these experiences in my life to train me. We live in a generation where, wow, we want to blame others for our predicament and for our emotional status. We play the blame game, and there's an anger and a bitterness. What we need to be really asking ourselves, no matter who we are, is how can this be used in my life for God's glory? Now listen to this. We know that verse, and we know, really? We know that God works, what? All things together for good. All things. The good things and even the hurtful things, God works all things together for good to those who love Him, who've, called, who've been called according to His purpose. And so I understand that everything in my life is for my training, so I'm ready to accomplish the mission that God sends me on. Praise God. Amen? So we understand the mission a little bit. We understand the need for training. We also need to understand that we need to stand strong. And man, that's the definition of a man. That's what a man, that's a definition of a man. A man is one who is strong and courageous to do the right thing for the glory of Jesus. That's the definition of a man. So we need to be strong. So how do I get strong? Well, if I can take you back to Ephesians chapter 6, we already have the answer for that. Uh, because he said in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Well, so how do I stand strong? Well, you need to be battle equipped. <laughs> you need to have the right equipment on. And they're really characteristics, aren't they? He would say just a few verses later, so stand firm then. Stand firm then. Stand strong. Stand firm then. With what? The belt of truth. Integrity. The truth of the gospel. The truth of scripture. God's truth. That's what puts everything together in our lives. Truth. Integrity. Uh, a, a, a right attitude. A, a, a right attitude, right motivation, so the body armor of righteousness, and then a, a recognition that my mission is the mission of Christ, and so I have the combat boots of the, the gospel, as it were, the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. I, I've got my shield, my protection of faith, because the enemy, Satan, is throwing all these fiery arrows at me, and I need to have that faith. I, the helmet of salvation, <laughs> man... Boy, how Satan is putting doubts and temptations in the minds and the hearts of older men and younger men. Oh, we need to know that we are forgiven because of the blood of Jesus and stand firm and strong in that. And then the, 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 the sword of the Spirit. We know the Word of God so that we can apply it to our circumstances in defeating our enemy so that we can continue the mission that God's put us on. And then finally... Um, Pray in the Spirit, it says here in Ephesians chapter 6. And that's our communication line with our command officer. A soldier who's disconnected from his command officer, he is in big, big trouble, isn't he? I mean, he is, he's, he's lost. He doesn't know whether to turn right, left, go forward, or backwards. He doesn't know whether he should, you know, heads up or duck down. If he doesn't have communication with the command officer, he's in trouble. He's in trouble. And so Paul says this, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. So that's how we stand strong. 
Well, dear men, dear men, big strong men, strong men in the Lord, um, be on mission. Train well. Um, be strong. So let me just finish with a, a word of prayer on your behalf. Father in heaven, Father in heaven, may the mission of Jesus fill our hearts. Strengthen us so that we are not distracted from what you've called us to do, that we might be men who are truly followers of Jesus. We are Jesus warriors. For your glory, not for ours, but for your glory, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. And men, can I add just a little P.S.? One of the deadliest things for us is when we're not on mission or we're not in training. If, I mean, we've heard that expression, idle hands are the devil's workshop, right? If we don't have anything to do, that's when Satan can really get a hold of us and get us to do all sorts of nastiness. We saw that demonstrated for us in the Old Testament by one of the greatest warrior kings ever. His name is David. And 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 says this, significant passage. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. So he sends out his general. It says here, they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. Listen to this. But David remained in Jerusalem. Now, where should David have been? He should have been on mission or he should have been training. But he should have been there with his men leading the charge. You know what the rest of the chapter is? Because David was idle. Because he was, didn't have anything really to devote his life into. He wasn't on mission. He wasn't training. That's when he got caught in that temptation. And he ended up committing adultery. And because of that, in the cover-up, he committed uh, murder and idolatry, and all sorts of other things, all because he wasn't on mission where he was supposed to be. One of the deadliest things, fellas, is not to be on mission or not to be in training. So let's be giving glory and honor to God by being on mission and training until God calls us to that very specific task of mission for him. So God bless you, men. God bless you. Be strong in Jesus' name. Christ is risen. <laughs> He's risen indeed.